Yeah, I'm Chris Boland, so uh, welcome to FRC. I know you're all happy to be here. I actually taught in the uh, distance education department for 11 years before moving over to SSI, Strategic Studies Institute, um, in December, actually teaching your 2302 class. So uh, you're my last class. I know the emotional pain is, is unbearable, <laughs> but, um, but welcome. Um, I know this, uh, this bites a little bit because there's no opportunity for lunch or eating in Bliss Hall. So what I'd like to do is just, uh, I'll try and keep an eye on time, but if I get to about 12, 20-ish, make sure someone start flagging things if I'm still talking, and uh, we'll get into Q&A, and if you want to take a break and get something to eat and drink before you're 1300, I'll let you go ahead and do that. Um, obviously, my contact info is up here. In terms of kind of my bona fides, I've kind of been doing something in and around the Middle East since about 1976, whether it's study in the region, uh, working in the region, and uh, a retired Middle East FAO actually had an opportunity uh, because I was active duty at the time to work as a foreign policy advisor for uh, two very different individuals, Vice President Gore and Vice President Cheney at the time, so those, that was an interesting transition to see up close and personal. Um, but I, but I, you know, I'm a policy wonk, uh, love talking and thinking and, uh, and hearing about the Middle East. So if you've got thoughts or questions as we move through the lecture here and discussion, please feel free to, uh, to bring it up. Don't have to wait till the end, but, but we will definitely have some time for Q&A. And again, there's my contact information if you do want to reach out. Um, afterwards and talk about anything uh, coming up. Uh, my Twitter account, you know, it's strictly national security policy stuff. I don't give restaurant recommendations <laughs> or any of that stuff. So if you're interested, great. Um, if you're not, you know, I'm not going to be offended here. So this is kind of a three-part lecture and um, understanding where you're coming from, I've also kind of given not only the question, right, the Socratic question that we're going to examine, but also given you my preliminary answers here to those questions. And, uh, and hopefully you'll be convinced at the end of the lecture um, that I've got it pretty much about right, but it's okay if you're not convinced. That's what a Q&A and debate is for. And these are really contentious issues. They're, um, they're up for debate. Most things at the national security level that are really important, you know, it's almost always a 49-51 split in terms of which way to go for policy. So it is debatable. Um, and that's, hopefully at least I'll give you some food for thought on the lecture for these three-part things. Um, I think most folks know this, but whether you're talking about IS, ISIL, ISIS, or as a lot of Arabs are increasingly call it, Daesh, which is a derogatory um, abbreviation for the term Adal al Islamiya fil Iraq wa Sham. It's all the same organization, right? And so we're talking, it's the same thing. You'll see it referred to uh, with different preferences. The Obama administration liked ISIL. Uh, Trump came in, kind of part of any new administration. Anything that was associated with the old administration is bad, so they like ISIS. Um, in Arabic, it's actually all the same. Um, it comes from Asham, and Asham either refers to kind of greater Syria, the Levant. Um, so no change in Arabic, but preference in terms of um, English reference. So brief, 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 brief history just for those who haven't followed it. I mean, I think there are a couple important, important points here. Um, and you'll see as I go through the lecture, I, I put a fair amount on the slides. Don't, you know, feel cheated if I don't talk about everything on there. It's kind of people learn and, uh, you know, differently. Some people like reading. Some people like listening. Some people like pictures. So I try and provide a little bit of all that for you. But I think the key thing is, I mean, there was no substantive Al-Qaeda presence in Iraq before the U.S. invasion, OIF in 2003, right? So that invasion, that occupation, actually spawned the creation of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was the predecessor to the Islamic State here. Now, a couple things happened. We had the surge here in 06, 07, and that really, that coupled, whether you call it the Sons of Iraq, the Anbar Awakening, that really was phenomenally successful, at least at a tactical and operational level, in really suppressing Al-Qaeda in Iraq 
and the emergent Islamic State. Levels of violence were down. Um, it was generally you know, looked at as a tactical or operational success. But a couple things happened that allowed for the resurrection, if you will, of the Islamic State. One was the civil war that opened up in Syria uh, toward the end of 2011. And that just provided more ungoverned space and it fed into an, a growing heightened sense of regional sectarianism, the Sunni Shia split in the region with everything kind of being viewed as a security competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And that additional space allowed the Islamic State to establish a foothold in Syria, and then that in turn allowed it to grow again in Iraq when coupled with increasingly sectarian policies of the Prime Minister al-Maliki. Um, kind of coincident with this, you have, of course, the U.S. withdrawal. That was actually, the timetable was negotiated by the Bush administration, but actually carried out by the Obama administration. And so this kind of leads to these simultaneous, the simultaneous events leading to two different conclusions in terms of what could have stopped or prevented the spread of ISIS, right? On the one side, you have, oh, it was the security vacuum left by the U.S. withdrawal that's responsible. If we had stayed, if we had done more, we wouldn't have this problem today. And then on the other side, you have, well, look, the Iraqis, the surge accomplished what it was supposed to do. It gave the Iraqis political space to resolve their issues and to pursue reconciliation and to grow a national unity government. It's the Iraqis who failed, Maliki in particular with his sectarian policies. So it's really the burden falls on the Iraqis. And you can see, depending on how you analyze this or which side of the fence that argument you come on, you have hugely different implications for what U.S. policy going forward ought to be. So what is ISIL? What is it today? Well, like many things, it's, there's no one answer at the strategic level, right? It's a couple of things. It's certainly a terrorist and insurgent group. It employs terrorism as a tactic um, to spread fear, to provoke overreaction, and to garner attention to the group's cause. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, it actually had a strategic break. There's certainly a personality issue of personal disagreements between Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, and um, al-Qaeda, and what's left of that in terms of how you pursue strategies, right? That was one of the unique things about the Islamic State, was al-Qaeda had this near abroad, far abroad, near enemy, um, and far enemy construct, and the Al-Qaeda strategy was, well, we've got to attack the far enemy, the United States, before we can actually start to garner a foothold in the region and establish a caliphate. The novelty or divergence, if you will, with the Islamic State strategy was, no, we're going to establish a caliphate in the here and now in the region, and then we're going to expand from there. Um, with you know, ISIS actually on the ropes here, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, there are some folks actually starting to talk about, particularly if uh, al-Baghdadi has been killed or once he does pass through the scene, that personal animosity between IS and al-Qaeda, uh, the strain and stresses on both groups actually may provide an opportunity for them to merge and you know, create yet another uh, kind of version of ISIS and al-Qaeda in terms of a threat to U.S. security. <laughs> Um, and then here, of course, it's also the unique aspect is of that, and it's a result of their strategy, is they are building a state. So they're actually kind of a proto-state. I mean, they have to run normal functions, and they do, of a state. They levy taxes. They um, have infrastructure they've got to run. They run social programs. They run schools. So you've got this whole aspect of a state to ISIL as well, which actually opened them up and made them a little bit more vulnerable to uh, kind of standard U.S. counterterrorism um, strategies and military strategies in particular. Big issue is, and again, this is a fair debate, right? How significant is the threat? I mean, there are a lot of sane, important voices in the U.S. foreign policy community and among political leaders who really see ISIS as an urgent, significant, and existential Threat. And of course, here you have Lindsey Graham at the top. He's talking about President Obama at the time. But so this is the side 
other folks, this is serious. We've really got to do something um, urgently and decisively to eradicate this threat to U.S. interests. And President Trump certainly falls in to that category as well. My take is a little more measured, and maybe that's the beauty of being an academic, right? Um, but, I mean, I think that the threat is certainly not zero, right? The threat from ISIS is real, but I do think on balance it's actually um, exaggerated. So let me make my case here, and then in the second part we'll see how effective the strategy's been. But if, again, putting things in perspective, really Western societies as a whole are really not subject to a lot of the violence that ISIS and terrorist groups are perpetrating. The, the real victims, 98% of the victims are victims in the region and their fellow Muslims or Iraqis or Syrians or Afghanis um, or Pakistanis, right? So the threat to Western countries is actually statistically at least uh, pretty minimal. And you can see that's even more so for the United States. And then here, that's the chart there is kind of a 10-year average of folks killed by those different categories um, since 9-11. Obviously, 9-11 would change that calculation a little bit, but not a whole lot. So you can see here by that chart, I mean, you're actually twice as likely to be killed by an armed toddler in the United States, statistically speaking. Okay, you're actually three times more likely to be killed by lightning, about seven times more likely to be killed by a lawnmower, and you're about a thousand times more likely to be shot by a fellow American. Even those are just pure statistics, right? But Rand has done a study on terrorist organizations, and kind of the heartening aspect of that is only 10% of terrorist organizations have ever, have ever achieved their expressed goals. So you've got a 90% failure rate. None of the folks who achieved that goal were religious in nature. So again, this is from about 1968, I think, to about 2006, this RAND survey um, of terrorist groups. And you can see the vast majority, like 83% of terrorist groups, that it was actually brought to an end through either a combination of policing or uh, political accommodations or changes. Now, it's a valid question to ask whether the Islamic State falls into you know, that normal trajectory, right? Or if there's something unique about the Islamic State, what it's doing, its ability to recruit um, online now through social media, does that change it? Does the fact that they're essentially an apocalyptic, apocalyptic group you know, that how are you going to politically compromise with the Islamic State? So maybe you've got to take the whole policy piece right off that chart. So that's, that's an important debate. It's something important to keep in mind as we go forward. Now here are some global trends in terrorism. And the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, just published this a couple weeks ago. But so if the overall threat of terrorism writ large to Americans is pretty low. It's even less so from the Islamic State in particular. And you can see some 94% of terrorist attacks worldwide were conducted by non-ISIL groups, right? So ISIL itself only accounts for some 6% of those terrorist attacks worldwide. Now a little more disturbing is the high rates of lethality of these attacks, right? And this gets to kind of the super empowered individual um, today. Uh, their access to weapons or even a truck that can go ahead and just drive across a bridge and kill, you know, kill several people at once, um, certainly maim and get a lot of propaganda and media attention of it. And of course, among the highest rates there you see were ISIL inspired attacks as well. So not, not a wholly encouraging picture but gives you some perspective. Now here are two charts. The first kind of charts the number of attacks, terrorist attacks worldwide, and then the bottom takes a look at the deaths. So it's really taking a look at um, overall lethality. 
So, you know, two things I think are readily apparent, right? One is both kind of spiked in the 2014-2015 time period where ISIL was really, that was, it was, you know, had a lot of battlefield success. It actually um, uh, occupied roughly, I think, a territory roughly equivalent to Great Britain. Over 10 million uh, folks, Syrian and Iraqis, were underneath their um, control, so to speak, underneath their authority. So that was at their peak. But the other thing you notice is both have actually really declined pretty substantially since that peak, which maybe suggests, you know, one of the conclusions I think that's fair is that, hey, counterterrorism strategies writ large, particularly counter-ISIS strategies, have actually, they're having an impact, right? It's not down to zero, probably won't be, but they're actually having a substantial impact, um, and so there's, there's reason for optimism in terms of how effective these policies have been. So this is where I kind of fall down. I mean, I, I do think it's a, it's a real threat. Again, it's not going to be zero. Um, the prospect of what are, folks are calling either lone wolf attacks, ISIS-inspired attacks, uh, loon wolf attacks, whatever, folks who are just bent on violence, and they're just looking essentially for any excuse to justify it, ISIS can provide, you know, that in spades. They don't need to do it in person. They can do that online now. They've certainly proven that. So, you know, we do have ISIS um, sympathizers in the country. George Washington University did a study, and there were like two years ago, there were as many as 50 to 70 cases. Um, in the courts in terms of uh, ISIS supporters in the United States. So they're here, they're likely here to stay, and they're going to conduct, you know, eventually they're going to be successful in conducting some attacks. But the, one of the disturbing things, and it's something that strategically our political leaders have to deal with, it's kind of if you buy this objectively, terrorism is a pretty manageable threat particularly to Americans, take a look at the public opinion polls. I mean, the question here is, ISIS is a serious threat to America's existence or survival. Do you agree or disagree? And you have somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80% of Americans see it as a threat to our survival or existence. At the same time, you've kind of got this objectively, terrorism isn't really a huge threat. So how is a political leader how do you develop a public strategy that attempts to reconcile those two things, or do you just ignore it? But it, it's a challenge, I think, confronting our senior leadership. So what's the U.S. to do about all that? Um, this is just coming from Philip Gordon, who was a senior official in the Obama administration. But if you're looking in terms of kind of the range of military tools that we've applied to this problem set, and then take a look at the results. We've kind of tried the spectrum and nothing seems to work, right? In Iraq, we had an invasion and an occupation, a couple hundred thousand troops, and what's the end result today? Chaos, confusion, violence, and civil war. In Syria, you know, we haven't really done much of anything, right? I mean, we've got special forces, yes, uh, the support to local groups is maybe rising, airstrikes are, are uh, increasing in number, but we kind of didn't do that, and the result is civil war, chaos, and violence. And in Libya, we tried the light footprint approach, right? Kind of NATO, others leading, um, the U.S. leading from behind, and what was the result there? Kind of chaos and civil war. So the range has been tried. Uh, the question is, what do you conclude from this, and, and where do we go from here? Um, I think the strategy, counter-ISIS counter strategy, has actually been fairly consistent. And I think the Trump administration has definitely uh, put it a little bit on steroids. But in terms of kind of applying the U.S. Army War College model, you see it laid out pretty clearly and directly here. I mean, President Obama in his speech in September um, 2014, I think. Yeah, 2014 laid out the objective, right? Here's a strategic objective. We're going to degrade and ultimately defeat. Pretty clear, okay? Got it. We're going to go through the 
dime. Let's see what's at the top of the list. It's going to be heavy military, right? You've got coalition airstrikes. You've got support to foreign fighters, so that's the M. You've definitely got intelligence operations, he talks about, and improving that. So that's kind of the I. You've got a counter ideology, which maybe is part of the diplomacy and the I. You've got huge support to humanitarian elements, which is the economic reconstruction piece, right? And then eventually he added the diplomatic piece, which is the Geneva process, which hasn't yielded much and has kind of been overtaken by the Ascana process with the Russians taking the lead more recently. But so you've kind of, you've got the Army War College model here in action in terms of counter ISIS strategy. I would argue it's been fairly successful. I mean, the ISIS caliphate is really crumbling before our eyes. That doesn't mean the threat's going to go away, but in terms of actually degrading, we've certainly accomplished that by almost any metric here, and maybe even setting the stage for an ultimate defeat. I mean, that'll be yet to be seen. It'll take place over time. But take a look. I mean, their territories, they've only got 7% of the territory of Iraq right now. Two major strongholds, one in Iraq, one in Syria, both urban, uh, Mosul and Iraq, and those are both effectively surrounded by coalition forces now and are actually in the final stages of taking those. So that territorial claim of having an Islamic caliphate in the world here and now is about ready to, to go. And folks like uh, Graham Wood, who in the Atlantic kind of argued, hey, if there's a center of gravity for ISIS, it's probably their ability to claim a caliphate. Well, we're about ready to test that proposition, I would argue. In a couple months, that caliphate will be no longer, and we'll see if that's actually effectively the center of gravity of the group or not. But coalition, uh, the foreign fighters, rather, are actually, that's down to a trickle. Used to be thousands of foreign fighters flowing primarily through Turkey into Syria. That's down to a handful. Um, you've seen the coalition airstrikes have really dealt a significant blow to ISIS fighters and their mid and senior uh, level leadership. Uh, their finances, Ernst and Young is an international finance um, accounting firm. They actually did an analysis of ISIS finances. At one time, they were kind of heralded or, or, or at least described as the richest terrorist group in history given their ability to control territory, oil, ransoms, levy taxes, and that whole bit. And now they're on the verge of financial collapse. Their uh, media presence is actually down both in terms of quantity and quality. So just by any significant metric here, ISIS is on at least headed towards strategic defeat, and they're at least on the defensive at a very least. Um, ISIS has no mass appeal. They're not even pretending to appeal to moderate Muslims, right? I mean, that's the whole nature. If you look at their videos and the, just the gross graphic nature of their videos, they're not trying to mobilize the masses. They're trying to recruit the already or near radicalized, right? And they just want to push them off the edge. So it's not a mass movement. And that imposes, I think, kind of some pretty severe limitations in terms of their futures for the prospects. And, uh, and brutality, I think, really is kind of counterproductive. It's driving folks away. The less folks they have that are under their control, their purview, the less access to resources, the, you know, they have less ability to tax folks, um, et cetera. So, you know, all in all, I think, a pretty positive sign. So what are the challenges, though, to U.S. strategy going forward. And again, we can agree or disagree. You're, you're welcome to, uh, to offer a counter. I think the first one is, you know, whether we've effectively had, whether we've called it a global war on terrorism or not, this is effectively what we've had as an organizing strategic framework for our battle against terrorist groups and ISIS in particular. The question is, you know, is that the right framework um, any strategy has inherent tensions, dilemmas, and risk. Uh, I think some of those with a framework of a global war 
on terrorism are kind of highlighted here, right? I mean, one is it can have a counterproductive nature. I mean, Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld at the time, you know, had a snowflake, interestingly enough, that went out. The key question was what? Are we creating more terrorists than we're killing them, right? So there, there's a recognition that there can be a counterproductive nature to um, kinetic military operations, right? You're going to have collateral damage, particularly in societies that are honor-driven. Um, is that going to create more of a backlash than you actually gain by killing some terrorist leaders, and is it worth it over the long term? Um, I think you can kind of take a look. We've at least some level, we've been at, at Groundhog's Day. I mean, the military campaigns have been repeatedly successful, right? I mean, we had Al-Qaeda on the ropes. We drove the Taliban from power in Kabul. We had Al-Qaeda in Iraq and ISIS after the surge down to a, you know, bare thread minimum. They were on the verge of defeat then. But we haven't been able to translate those military successes into really sustainable political outcomes or regional stability. So that, I think, has been the, and that's where the big problem is, I think, is it's at the strategic level. It's not in the operational or tactical level. It's at the strategic level where we're really confronting problems. And folks recognize this, right, on both sides of the spectrum. Folks have said, whether it's Romney or Obama, there is no military solution to this problem, but we kind of sure act that way, right? I mean, what are we talking about when we talk about heightening the campaign against ISIS? It's almost inevitably, are we going to put in 4,000 troops? Are we got to put in 5,000 troops? Are we putting in a Marine, uh, you know, artillery battery to uh, help with Raqqa? Um, so it almost always defaults to that, which I think is a problem for us. So what else? Particularly in, in this, the campaign in, in Syria really draws this to a head, right? In addition to that big overarching strategic question about whether the framework for the war on terrorism is right, um, is you've got all these competing coalition priorities. And really, Folks in this counter-ISIS coalition, that's big. If you look at the State Department website, we've got 63, I think, some countries who are actively participating in the anti-ISIS coalition campaign, right? So it's a, it's a substantial coalition effort. But as with any coalitions, and you know, you learn this in World War II, right? There are some frictions between coalition partners. And one of the strategic challenges is how do we mesh the different perspectives and priorities of our coalition partners into a coherent campaign. And Syria is really, really problematic for that. One, the internal dilemmas with the U.S., right? What are we prioritizing? Are we prioritizing the counter-ISIS fight or are we prioritizing the overthrow of Assad as our strategic objective? And the argument will go, look, if we don't, prioritize ISIS, um, then, you know, if, if ISIS goes, what are we left with if, if we don't have Assad in power? If you've got Assad in power, he's brutal, but, you know, that family's been running the country fairly effectively, if brutally, for decades, right, without a severe threat to U.S. interests. But if he goes, what's the likely prospect for who's going to and what is going to succeed him? It's probably radical Islamic groups. Right? Is that going to ultimately serve U.S. interests? Probably not. So the U.S. has kind of been bouncing back and forth. The Trump administration actually bounced back and forth a little bit. Initially through the campaign, it was all about not getting engaged in Syria, not worrying about Assad or the dictators, and focusing solely on the ISIS fight. Then you had the cruise missile strikes against the Syrian air base in the wake of the chemical attacks, and there was some kind of waffling right on the part of the administration. Some folks were saying, well, we're still prioritizing the ISIS fight. Then you had other folks kind of saying, well, you know, Assad's really a bad actor and we're going to have to take care of him eventually, so kind of hinting at regime change. Uh, supposedly in the next uh, week or so, the administration will be coming out with a, with a Syria policy and, and according to press accounts, anyhow, it's going to fall on the side of, um, of prioritizing the ISIS fight. 
but we'll see. So we've got that internal debate, but then we've got huge debates with other folks in the region who are actively engaged in this campaign, right? One is Russia and Iran. Of course, they're aligned with Assad and his government. Their theory is we prop up the existing government, and that's the best guarantee against a, the emergence of a radical Islamist uh, group, coalition, cohort, whatever, in Damascus. So in the U.S., of course, is not buying into that. Um, and you have this, we're kind of on an escalation ladder right now. And, I mean, we'll see where it goes. But the battle space around Syria and Raqqa in particular is really congested now. It's small, confined space. And increasingly, you have U.S. and U.S. allied forces in kind of more or less direct competition or conflict with Syrian, Russian, and Iranian bat forces. So the question is, you know, will that kind of spiral out of control um, or not? I mean, we'll, we'll see. And then, I mean, you still have in terms of not doing anything isn't a great option because these refugees are a real serious issue, right? I mean, you've got over half of the Syrian population are classified as refugees, either internally displaced or they fled outside to other locations, both within the region and Europe. Um, you've got about a million refugees in Europe. That's kind of upset a lot of the domestic politics there and increased divisions within the EU. And then even more close to the region, I mean, you've got a lot of regional countries hosting literally millions of these refugees. Turkey's hosted well over a million. Um, Lebanon, one-fifth of their population right now are Syrian refugees. One-fifth of their population. And then you've got very kind of poor Jordan, really doesn't have much in terms of economic resources to go, but is a, a critical U.S. ally, is being, you know, they're hosting several hundred thousand, about 700,000 Syrian refugees, and they don't have the economics or infrastructure to take care of it. So it, it's a threat to internal regional stability, too, and, and there's risk of spillover. Um, so what else needs to be done? So we'll close here. I've got kind of three, three major items I'd ask you to consider. One, and this I think is the biggest challenge, and I've kind of been hinting at this all along, right? I mean, I think the challenge for us is we've got to embed this counterterrorism strategy that's heavily focused on military operations within a broader political, economic, regional strategy that actually fosters stability in the region. I see terrorism as really not the cause of the instability, and this is debatable, right? But I think it's a symptom of the broader crises and challenges confronting the region. And we'll talk a little bit about those just to give you a sense for it. Um, but I always try and slip in some uh, subliminal educational options for you, right, if you want to read more. I mean, so the first book is by Nadia Shadlau, and she really does, she does a good historical case study of kind of how U.S. has actually successfully in the past uh, taken operational military victories and built them into sustainable political outcomes. But we've, we've largely failed to do that post 9-11. So if you're interested in that question, that's a good resource. And then you really have a debate about what these Arab uprisings are all about and where they're going to go. And uh, two interesting folks on fairly opposite sides of the spectrum I recommend to you is Fawaj uh, George is a Lebanese-American academic at the London School of Economics. He kind of says, look, he kind of sees this as a fairly hopeful trend toward pretty much Western-style democracy, right? He takes a look at what the uprisings were all about, um, who really was the initial motivating force, what were the initial... Uh, slogans that motivated folks to come out and overthrow these autocratic rulers. And it was peaceful, non-Islamic solutions to the problems, right? So he kind of sees it as, yeah, this, this may well be a long-term transition to Western-style democracy. Uh, Shadi Hamid is at Brookings Institute. He's Egyptian-American. He kind of makes the case in this Islamic exceptionalism argument that that's not necessarily true. I mean, his case is, look, Christianity, and we'd all like to see uh, 
societies in the Middle East go through this transition similar to what Christianity did with the Reformation, the Enlightenment, uh, the separation of church and state, etc. But he says Islam's a different religion. So there may well be a different outcome for Islam, right? And Islam is really embedded in the region, much more so than Christianity is in much of the Western world. Um, so that's not a particularly likely outcome. So we're going to have to accommodate ourselves to some solution that really involves um, Islamist, if you will, so political Islamists, folks who think Islam has an important role to play in government, society, and daily life. Um, and that may not be our ideal solution, but it may well be what we have to be comfortable with. So here I think, think about this terms of, uh, in terms of a battle for ideology or a sense of identity in the region. And this is what I think is the bottom underlying cause here. And I've listed these, if you're going to categorize them, uh, some kind of four major categories here, and they go roughly chronologically, right? So the, the longest pedigree of how you organize society and how you identify yourself actually is with Islam at its heart. And that was the centuries of the Ottoman Empire and before then the Islamic Caliphate, right? Um, so that's got a long, long pedigree and, and probably is going to have, you know, an important role to play going forward. You had Pan-Arabism, the heyday, 50s, 60s, Gamal Abdel Nasser, that largely kind of fell to the wayside with the uh, Israeli defeat of the Arab armies and the four Arab-Israeli wars. That's kind of gone off to the wayside. So will it still play a role? Yeah, but probably not. Um, number one, uh, state-based nationalism. I mean, that secular nationalism, that's really only been in place since post-World War I, post-World War II. So not hugely deep roots there, right? But it still does mean something to be Iraqi, means something to be Saudi, means something to be Emirati and Lebanese, et cetera. And then lastly, you have Western-style democracy. And a lot of the discussion in the region actually revolves around Iraq. And they go ahead and look at what happened in Iraq, and they're going, uh, maybe not such a good fit for us, right? So we'll see how that goes. But that's that battle, that debate about how to organize themselves, how they see themselves, is something that's going on in the region. And I think the U.S., frankly, doesn't have a whole lot to say with that debate, right? It's a question of identity. They're going to have to resolve that for themselves. But this is just a result of some polling done by Shibli Talhami at the University of Maryland. And you can see it's roughly a one-third, one-third, one-third split, right, in terms of whether we identify as a citizen of our country, as an Arab, or as a Muslim, primarily first and foremost. And so roughly divided, you see actually if there's a trend there, it's a decreased tendency to identify as a Muslim, maybe as a result of the violence um, and the rise of the Islamic terrorist groups in the region. And there's actually a doubling of a sense of, and this is due to the social media, et cetera, of now we we're, really we're see ourselves as citizens of the world. And that's probably more true for, for the youth uh, than others. So it just gives you a sense of the scale of the socioeconomic problems here in the region. I uh, won't go into a lot of detail there, but those numbers ought to give you a sense for what will be required to address these issues. And it's not going to be done internally by the region alone. It's going to take a monumental international commitment to deal with those kinds of issues, right? I mean, the highest unemployment rates in the world got some of the highest uh, uh, youth um, that mean you can't even sit still with your economy. You've got to be growing your economy to absorb quite literally hundreds of thousands of youth year in, year out to find adequate employment for them. And if you can't find adequate employment, particularly for young men, um, there may be a problem there ahead, right, that feeds into this whole terrorism thing. Um, two, I think we have to have an adult public conversation about the risk of terrorism and what to do. And just quickly, uh, so we can get to q and I mean, again, I'll bring up kind of the standard war college stool, right? If the strategy is all about balancing your objectives, your ways, and means, if you've got this war on terrorism, if you've got this over-exaggerated sense of terrorism as a threat, uh, 
You're going to overemphasize the military, which is going to create imbalance and risk. And it's going to be impossible to have a rational discussion about how much, in terms of resources, you ought to devote to this problem. Because if it's a small-scale problem and you're spending literally trillions of dollars on it, that's trillions of dollars you're not using to address other issues, right? So just a question there for you. And then three, I think it's a good idea, just keep in mind, I think go local both here and abroad. The Washington Institute for Near East Policy actually did a wonderful study just a couple months ago, and it talked about how to build resiliency at home in terms of battling violent extremist groups. And its conclusion was that the key are not efforts at the national or international level, but they're at the local community level. Those are the folks who understand and can kind of see who is, who is most uh, susceptible to radicalization, because that can happen just over the internet, right? Um, so national authorities can't be tracking every single individual, but those local, particularly those local Muslim communities, um, actually can kind of see trends that somebody is vulnerable to radicalization and can engage local law enforcement or other social groups to actually, you know, try and intervene and prevent that radicalization. And the same, I think, is true you know, overseas. I mean, you take a look at the, here's an Inspector General report just a couple days ago, um, talks about the trillions of dollars the U.S. has invested in Afghanistan reconstruction. A lot of that's been at the national level, but it's just overwhelmed the country. It's not sustainable by the country itself, and it actually ends up feeding corruption in a lot of ways because that's a lot of foreign money flowing into a country that can't absorb it. So their conclusion, they did some, they looked at what's been successful in Iraq so far, and their conclusion there too is, hey look, go local. You gotta get the local communities engaged, they've gotta tell you what their priorities are, and you have to turn it over to local authorities to let them run it, because then it will be sustainable, then it will have an impact. And lastly, uh, Kevin Weddle in particular, I, I guarantee you he will have at least one Churchill quote so I want to feed, you know, and set you up for success um, in his presentation here in terms of uh, strategic leadership here. But uh, again, these are strategic questions here, right? We've never quite addressed Petraeus's question that he posed, right? Tell me how this ends. So we've got to decide as the United States what we think are susceptible, acceptable outcomes in Iraq, Syria, and the battle against ISIS. So that requires the establishment of a clear, political, strategic objective. I think we do have to realize that we've probably over-militarized this problem, and what's really going to, if those socioeconomic problems really are the problems, it's going to take a lot of diplomacy, it's going to take a lot of economic um, investment, not all by the U.S., maybe not even the majority by the U.S., but the U.S. is going to have to lead some kind of international coalition that also includes non-governmental uh, actors, NGOs, and attempts to build kind of civil society in the Arab world so that they can be resilient, they can risk the, uh, resist the temptations to radicalization, and that will be, you know, that would represent something tangible, I think, uh, for the longer term. Uh, the alternative, I think, probably, and we may not get there, right? Does the U.S. public have the strategic patience for this? Maybe now, in the absence of a major attack, maybe. But if we suffer another attack that eventually is inevitable, probably not. Do we have the willingness to invest in the non-military instruments of power? Eh, I don't know. I mean, you know, DOD has a huge constituency in the business world, in local communities, in states, uh, State Department, USAID, they don't have it. So, but I think the alternative is probably we're going to be stuck in this groundhog stay loop uh, for a long time to come. So, questions, debates, issues, disagreements? Sure. Right. 
Right. To sort of just set our costs on mm-hmm. and all that, even Hamas, and they've been called out. That whole ideological end doesn't seem to be talk, talked a lot about that. And we see the new pressure coming in to get big money involved in Iran and get them to do the right thing. Of what, what occurred with the extremist political uh, movement in prison and in Iran. So I think it is, right? It's part ideological. There's definitely a Sunni-Shia split that has really been heightened, as you say, certainly since 1979, but also heightened and magnified two, three, four times over with the U.S. intervention in Iraq, right? Because Saddam was at least viewed by the major Sunni powers as a bulwark against that Iranian expansion. When we remove that and you start talking about democracy, the majority of the population in Iraq are... Shia. So what's the inevitable outcome? A Shia government, the Saudis and the Gulf states were not interested in that at all. They actively campaigned, you know, against that transition, right? So all this has been feeding into the dispute. My my own sense is that we ought not play that. Saudi Arabia has a vested interest in playing this up, right? But we don't. We ought to preserve our options. I mean, the U.S. and Iran had a pretty productive relationship for decades throughout the Cold War, right? And one of the ironic things about Iran is the highest public approval ratings of the United States in America and our cultures and values in the region are in Iran, right? So there's a huge, you know, support among the youth for what we stand for. So there's potential out there. Um, I think playing into that sectarian conflict is just going to be, it's never ending, no good is going to come of it from the United States standpoint. And I, I fear we're kind of getting in that mode right now. I mean, we've traditionally played this balance of power politics games. I'm just not sure in an era of media where people and societies are actually rising up against authoritarian government that that's the way forward. I mean, I think we have to find a way to engage people um, on a more direct kind of personal local community level. That's going to require a lot of sophisticated diplomacy. Uh, we'll, see if we're, we'll see if we're up to it. Yes, sir. Uh, Dave Ott, Seminar 22. How, how do you get Arab countries to take, uh, to take more ownership of the challenges faced in the Middle East rather than having the token 10-member Saudi team that just kind of sits in the fob and they kind of wave the flag. How do you really get them to kind of take ownership of the problems that are facing so it's not a Western intervention all the time taking on all these challenges? Well, this is a dual-edged sword, right? I mean, in some ways, this is what Obama tried to do in Libya, right? He wanted the Arabs and the Europeans in particular to take a leadership role, that hasn't really worked out. The Saudis have really stepped up, unusually, in a leadership role in Yemen. That's not exactly turning out too well. So it's, you know, like many things, I think it's kind of, it's not an on-off switch, it's really a continuum, um, and it's useful to engage them, and we've got to remind them that ultimately they own the problems. Of course, their counter is that well, okay, then we're the ones who are going to run with it, so let us deal with things the way we're dealing with them. And you get folks like President el-Sisi, who's a U.S. Army War College grad, yay, um, and he's, you know, his idea is you violently repress any political Islamic group. Now, I don't think that's a solution for success going down. I mean, I think there has to be, when a society is facing these, the kind of problems we highlighted here, there needs to be an outlet 
if you remove that outlet, folks will find a violent, illegal way to express their opposition. So, you know, we've got to just keep at it and at it. And to the extent we can, work with more local communities, uh, local groups. But the reality, too, is it's a state-based world, and Egypt can say no, Russia can say no, and they have been. So, you know, I think we've got to try and strike that balance as best we can, but it is going to be a balance. It's not going to be anything that's perfect or ideal. We're going to be working with imperfect leaders um, in the region, but we've got to try and nudge that ball forward um, every chance we get. Part of it can be, you know, Obama actually withheld a lot of military assistance to Maliki, and the strategy was to do exactly that, right? It's like, okay, you're pursuing sectarian policies in Iraq that we don't think are useful to fostering stability. You own it, go ahead, but we're not going to support your effort. And he held back, and of course, critics will say, well, holding back wasn't the right decision because you had the emergence of ISIS. That's a threat to the United States. So those are tough. They're tough strategic issues. I think they're really going to be, there's also not going to be a one regional template that you can apply across the board because all the countries are a little bit different. They face these problems kind of more or less to different degrees. So it, it's going to require, again, a lot of unique, tailored uh, programs, I think, to, to push this one up the hill. Sir. Lieutenant Colonel Forrest, uh, Seminar 11. Uh, your assumption that, uh, I, I agree with your uh, argument that ISIS is a low threat to the U.S., especially at the homeland, uh, but red teaming it and taking the other opinion then, what is the possibility that ISIS goes to bed after Raqqa and Mosul defeats in the middle Euphrates River Valley in towns like Dar Azar and Mayadin, and then uh, poses not only a threat conventionally, but unconventionally to us using, say, chemical weapons or biological weapons? Sure, it will. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt. I mean, that's a major trend to terrorist groups, particularly ones that don't realize whatever their objectives are. They fragment, they increasingly get radicalized and more violent. So this is something we're going to be dealing with for a long, long time. So, I mean, if the measure, this is where I think the adult conversation comes in. If your expectation is we're never going to suffer a terrorist attack or it's unacceptable um, to suffer any terrorist attack um, on U.S. soil, that's an impossible standard. We'll invest trillions and not achieve that objective. So building kind of a resilient society on the U.S. front, the Israelis have done it. I mean, they suffer terrorist attacks on a fairly regular basis, and they, you know, they're not panicked about it, they don't go into hull defilade. Arguably, sometimes they overreact on the military front, depending on whether you're Palestinian or Lebanese, you might have a different uh, take on that overreaction. Um, but it's something we're just, we're gonna have to live with it. But look, we live with it. How, what's the war on crime doing? How are we doing there? Well, how about the war on poverty that Johnson initiated? How are we doing there? So, I, you know, I think that's just, it's, you know, humans have a good side and we have a bad side. And uh, it's just, that's, that violence, that terrorism will always be with us. We ought to work to mitigate it, um, but it's going to happen. So let's just be adult, mature about it. Sure, up front. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that kind of gets to the competing coalition objectives here, right, particularly with the Turks. I mean, the Turks are absolutely apoplectic about regional autonomy, let alone an independent Kurdistan. And Kurds have a different perspective, and they're actually talking about, hey, look, these lines no longer exist. We've not been at the table when these lines were originally drawn, but we're here at the table now, and we're the ones actually carrying out this fight for you, so we want an independent Kurdistan going forward. Um, I, I think that's probably unlikely just because I don't see a lot of support for it in the region and I don't see a lot of willingness in terms of the U.S. or others to 
impose that kind of agreement, but I do think they'll probably successfully carve out um, high degrees of autonomy for themselves in both, uh, certainly in Iraq and in whatever comes after uh, Syria. Whether Syria will be, you know, reconstructed as a, as a unitary state again, I think is really an open question. If it does, it'll probably be much more federalized, uh, huge regional autonomy, uh, both in the north with the Kurds, um, in the south and east um, with the Sunnis, and then with the Alawite population in the uh, west around Latakia. So maybe something will be Syria official, but there will be a lot of local flexibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The de-escalating some zones with Russia. Right. How do you see that playing out with uh, the defeat of ISIS in Raqqa and Damascus? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's in large measure up to us in terms of how we, how that ends up playing out. How I really see it is, I mean, in this, I put it in terms of. Or us as in Damascus. Well, good. There's a real question in terms of yeah, where that, who has how much authority right now. You know, I mean, President Trump has said he's delegated a lot of authority to the military. So General Mattis will have a lot to say about it. By all accounts, though, he and uh, General McMaster, the National Security Advisor, have a good, close relationship, so they're talking all the time. Um, I worry that we don't have kind of a real, someone with genuine political credentials and a sense for what's possible with the American public, um, that we don't have somebody at the table who can you know, speak with that voice. But I think that the big challenge there, and ultimately I think uh, Russia and Iran have the upper hand and Syria does too, is just in terms of the relative level of importance of the national interest engage, right? For Syria and Assad, this is a survival existential fight. And they're, not, they're gonna throw everything they possibly can into that battle to include chemical weapons if it comes to it. For Russia, Syria is their only foothold in the region really left, right? I mean, they've had that relationship for decades. It's their only base access to the Eastern Mediterranean. It's at least a vital national security interest for them. For Iran, I mean, the Shia account for only 15% of the population in the region. So that really accounts for some of the regional alignment between Iran and Syria. And Iran can only arm and equip Hezbollah through Syria. So Syria is a vital national security interest for Iran. Where's Syria in terms of U.S. global national security interest? I think, right? It's down here. So they, they own the escalation ladder, I think. So whatever we do, they're likely to escalate because ultimately it's more important to them than it is to us. And that's the real risk for things kind of spinning out of control. It's not particularly heartening. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, sir, yeah, feel free, everybody. I mean, I know you're on a tight schedule. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Barkham, uh, Seminar 16. You had the uh, displacement map uh, up there earlier, and my question is, do you see uh, any abatement to that, and is it permanent? Uh, is there any real conditions that may uh, stem or reverse current migration patterns. Right, yeah, I think, I mean, I think maybe we've come to kind of a, a natural um, place where it's just leveled off. It's not gonna get a whole lot worse just because it physically can't. Over half your population is already displaced, so it can't get much worse. The folks who had the economic wherewithal to leave have already left, so the ones who are there really just don't have any other options, so they're kind of stuck. But that's where the kind of speed and effort on the reconstruction front gets to the, probably the more important piece of your question, which is can we reverse the tide? Well, there will have to be some major, major reconstruction. Uh, the initial estimates for Aleppo alone, I think, are 100 to 200 billion dollars in reconstruction just for Aleppo alone. So those efforts are going to have to get in place quickly, get spun up, if there's any hope of reversing the tide. But if you look at historical trends, 
it's probably not going to happen. You're beating the historical trend because once people uh, land in another territory, they start making a home. There's very little to go back to. Um, so again, not really optimistic scenario. Wish I wish I could do better than that. Um, why don't I, folks are starting to filter in for the next presentation. I'll stick around up front if you do have other questions. But really, congratulations on getting here to FRC. Good luck and enjoy second year. It's not as good as first year, but it is what it is. So.